Today we're going to talk about Shakespeare's text and how it goes from the scribblings that Shakespeare wrote in his room on some paper with a nib pen to these like glossy beautiful editions that we have today and like what came between the two. There's kind of two different tracks. Um, the first track I'm going to talk about is how we get from Shakespeare's scribblings to the plays happening in his time. How that is usually described as going is you have the like stack of papers that you scribble, 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 he writes the whole play of Hamlet, and we call those foul papers um, or a rough draft. So an initial pile of papers he writes and maybe he has another draft. So there's like rough draft number one and then there's like a rough draft number two and maybe there's a bunch of those but after that eventually he's like okay now it's ready to show to someone and so instead of giving them the like maybe the first copy the first thing he wrote out remember all of this is still happening by hand he'll copy it out into an author's fair copy where it's like clean and easier to read from there like that would probably be shown to other people friends and colleagues possibly a patron if there was someone commissioning the work. It's likely that that would then be sent to a scribe who would produce more copies. Um, so if that's the author's fair copy, um, this would be like ready for a prompt book, which would be getting you ready for um, an actual production of this. So um, typically there would be like one copy that we know of that would be in the playhouse while people were producing a play of the entire play. But what the actors would get would be not a whole copy of the play. When people act today, they're given a copy of the whole play because it's not difficult to make copies of a whole play. But when everything is being produced, literally written out by hand, you don't want to write a whole copy of Hamlet out for Bernardo, who's in three scenes. You don't need to see like the text of all of Hamlet's soliloquies for the actor playing Bernardo. What you'd have instead is cue scripts. A scribe would go from the like fair copy or the prompt book, the whole play, and then copy out all the lines for Claudius would go in Claudius's cue script, and all the lines for Polonius would go in Polonius's cue script, and all the lines for Hamlet would go in Hamlet. So, and this comes up in Midsummer. Have you the lion's part written for? I pray you give it me, for I'm slow of study. He's asking for like the written out lines for the lion. Of course, the lion doesn't have any lines in their original interpretation of the play of Pyramus and Thisbe. It's all he's supposed to do is roar. Sometimes Shakespeare will use the fact that actors don't know what the other actors are gonna say and are just waiting for their last couple words to like jump in and say their next line. There's a scene in The Merchant of Venice where a character keeps interrupting Shylock. Um, and Shylock keeps ending his sentences with the with the words, my bond, I will have my bond. Immediately after saying, I will have my bond, he then will say, I will not hear you speak. Or like, he'll say things like, stop interrupting me. But it makes sense when you try and play it out with cue scripts because the actor playing the role of the character who speaks after Shylock has to keep jumping in ready to say his lines every time Shylock says my bond. And it gives Shylock a reason to be like, shut up, stop talking over me. Like I'm not done speaking yet. Like his character is annoyed at the ways people are talking over him. But Shakespeare writes it into the play knowing how the actor's parts are laid out. Typically Shakespeare will not give a cue multiple times where the actor is supposed to say it. But sometimes, He'll do it for a dramatic effect. Okay, so once we have cue scripts, actors have their parts, and then we don't need the text anymore because the actors are the ones containing the words. That's all you need to like put on a play of Hamlet. But if that's the whole chain of the text, we wouldn't still be reading Hamlet today. We would not have access to it. And in fact, many plays from that time were never printed. So the whole track, they went from file papers to fair copies to cue scripts and performance and that was it. We know of at least one play that by Shakespeare, Cardinio. Uh, there's also speculation of Love's Labors 1. Cardinio we have like a record of it being performed. We just don't know what it's about or what it sounds like or what the words we don't we don't have a record of it because it wasn't printed but the ones that were printed how did that happen? At this point we have like a lot of paper that could potentially be printed. So typically what's thought is that when a printed edition was made, it would be made from one of those fair copies. Um, let's talk a little bit about book sizes at the time. Today when books are published, it's like three sort of like main rankings of books. Um, 
there's like hardcover books which are usually fancier and more expensive like if it's an art book it's usually going to be hardcover there's paperbacks and often books will go from hardcover to paperback you'll do the most expensive one first and then do the cheap version once people have already like bought it a bunch of times um and then some books will have mass market like this is especially true of like thriller novels or mysteries or things that they are considered sort of like not fancy literature um in Shakespeare's day, the biggest, fanciest literature, um, Bibles, theological works, important documents, were published in folio. That means that the, the paper that they were printed on was folded only once, and they were quite large. Smaller, cheaper books were published um, in quarto. So you'd have, you suddenly get four sheets, and then you can do octavos, which are eight. The uh, original sheet is divided into eight, not so folio, quarto, octavo. You can do twelve mo. There's like lots of interesting like ways you can make it even more intense. But like the smaller the book, usually the cheaper the book. And so when Shakespeare's plays were published during his lifetime, they were published in quarto. So the um, first quarto of Hamlet. Um, when it was first printed and stops being a handwritten copy and becomes a printed copy. I don't have letterpress. I just have some have some rubber stamps, so uh, it's, this is a low-tech version. But suddenly it's printed and you can make many, many copies. So instead of showing a Q1 like this, I'm going to show you a Q1 that is like many, many, many copies of Hamlet. I printed it and so the first time you don't need to have a person writing out each word by hand it may be expensive to do more paper and you won't make more copies than you think you'll sell, but printing can be a source of income. So that's how we have our first quarto. And it's called the first quarto because there's going to be additional quartos. In Hamlet, the first quarto is significant because while quartos are typically um, done from the author's fair copy, um, the first quarto is quite different from the quartos that come later and the first folio, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, it's one of the, they've heard what people sometimes refer to as the bad quartos. Several Shakespeare plays, including Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, and Tammy of the Shrew, uh, where there are quartos that are quite different from the later editions of the play. And it is unclear whether Shakespeare's play like went to production and then later he was like no you know I'm gonna change some things up and make it different or whether it was like pirated in some way whether like the actor who played Hamlet like sold his cue script on the sly and people like put together the play based on the cue script that seems unlikely but it has been argued in the past there's lots of speculation about why it's so different but the big point here is that it's quite different characters have different names. Even the most famous line in Shakespeare, to be or not to be, that is the question, in the first quarto is not to be or not to be, that's the, that is the question. It is to be or not to be, I, there's the point. That's the line in the first quarto edition, which is quite a different line. Much shorter and it's very snappy. It's actually quite good on stage. Um, so whatever scholars have thought, thought in the past about it being like garbage compared to Shakespeare's later work, there's something really compelling about it and I think it speaks to our expectations of this play now when we look at Hamlet we expect Hamlet to be something very different than this like scrappy little play that we see in Q1. So for whatever reason there's a much longer many people think more sophisticated play that gets published later Q2. There's also a Q3 so at this point we've got like a whole stack of Hamlets that are Q1, a whole stack of Hamlets that are Q2, and these are like published, printed, mass produced to a certain degree. After Shakespeare dies, the first folio is published. So I mentioned earlier that quartos were cheaper books than folios. Folios were very impressive and very large. I have a facsimile of a first folio here. It is quite impressive and large. I think the actual first folio is more impressive and larger. But what a facsimile is, it'll show you like page by page, like a photocopy of what the pages look like if you were to look at an actual first folio. All of the spelling and capitalization, which is non-standard and crazy from the time. So let's talk about the first folio. First folio is the complete works of Shakespeare published together after his death. It's very significant for the continuation of Shakespeare as this cultural figure. It was the first book of 
plays to be published in this way, typically plays were done in quartos, if they were done at all. And, and typically they weren't. About half of Shakespeare's plays we wouldn't have today if it weren't for the first folio. Um, Hamlet's not one of them. Like I said, there are already three quartos, but Hamlet was one of the plays published in the first folio. But one of the things that's important about the first folio is that it was trying to establish Shakespeare's legacy after his death. Um, it was put together by his friends. It had a like portrait of Shakespeare in it. In early publications of some of Shakespeare's plays, Titus Andronicus doesn't even like get his name on the play when it's published in quarto. They mention that it was performed by the Lord Chamberlain's men, which was Shakespeare's company, but like it's not even considered like a selling point that this person named Shakespeare wrote Titus Andronicus, which is very interesting. Today, Shakespeare is such a big name and definitely a big selling point that it's hard to picture. So what happens after that? Like, how do we get from these, like, quartos and the first folio and, like, all this other stuff, like, how do we get to here? Like, sudden, now we have printed editions, but the printed editions we've already discussed are not the same as each other. They have significant differences. Um, maybe not as significant as some of the, like, handwritten copies that were co copying each other, but, like, still, there are differences. We even had some of these come up in class, like, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, or oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would melt. Which one is it? Unclear. And it's not like, oh, one is original. What is original in all these editions? Do we mean which one is written by Shakespeare? Because there's a lot of editor's hands in the way. Transcribing the person, rewriting the person, laying the type into the printer. It's a complicated thing. A lot of the editing work that we're starting to see happened with Nicholas Rowe in the 1700s when he started republishing complete works of Shakespeare, but he was organizing the plays more according to the conventions of the day. So he put in the act numbers and the scene numbers. He usually put in a dramatis personae telling you who all the like characters in the play were going to be. He also, if you ever read like, this is takes place by the seaside, that is almost certainly not original to Shakespeare and was added a hundred years later. But these editors like Nicholas Rowe and afterwards had all these different texts that they could draw from. And sure, they could reprint just what's in the folio. That's one way of doing it. But sometimes they read the quartos and they're like, well, I like that bit from that quarto. And I like this bit from the folio. And so I'll conflate them. I'll make it a combination. Which seems like in some ways the right thing to do, but there's a lot of artistic choice that goes into that question. One example from Romeo and Juliet is in the balcony scene. We have Juliet saying in Act 2, Scene 1, Line 82, What's Montague? It is not hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name! Nor any other part belonging to a man? Can sound a little bit like Juliet is making a dirty joke. However, that is a joke that is entirely composed by the editors of this play. In the folio, Juliet says, What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face. Oh, be some other name belonging to a man. And in the first quarto, Juliet says, What's Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part. What's in a name? So the conflation puts the two together, but in doing so makes this joke, which somebody wrote, and it's written out of words written by Shakespeare, but it's not a joke that Shakespeare made. So there's something really interesting about, like, whose play are we looking at? So that's a lot of where this text is going and what's happening to it. A lot of these things are still being played with today, and a lot of these are pieces of information that are very accessible online. The website Internet Shakespeare Editions will let you look at original spellings of a lot of these plays, as well as facsimiles of many of them, so you can look and see what the like words look like on the page. And there's a lot of things that can influence how things get changed. Sometimes when books went to be published, they got, ran into trouble with the stationer's register who like decided which books were allowed to be published or not. It is a very different thing when the expectation is you have to get permission before you're allowed to print anything. And it's a reason why some plays were never circulated in 
print at all. Um, there's a very politically subversive play by Thomas Middleton called A Game of Chess, which um, was never printed because you had to like get permission to print it, but was circulated widely. There were many copies written out in manuscript, um, and we still have some of those copies today. One of the things I find really interesting about this is a lot of people, when they produce Shakespeare or think about Shakespeare, they think about Shakespeare as being one authentic thing. And something I love about being a little bit more explicit about this whole messy process of writing is that there's not a single point at time when it becomes the play Hamlet and that everything before that is not Hamlet and everything after an adulteration of Hamlet. This is all Hamlet. When you produce a production of Hamlet that's like super crappy. That's also Hamlet. This text is voluminous. The text not only contains multitudes, but it is made up of multitudes. And there's something really flexible and expansive about what we mean when we say the name of a play by Shakespeare. That even as it is, even when you're not including a director or a designer or a costumer or whatever, there's already so many people's hands in on this thing. And it makes me feel like we today can all be part of that, deciding what it is, what makes Hamlet Hamlet. What are the lines that are the most important and which ones, if you're making a production, are you going to maybe cut and not keep in the production? All of these are choices and it gives us all the opportunity to decide what these plays mean and what they can mean in the future. So that's your introduction to textual culture.